We can okay. see Ashley. It's good. Well, thank you. And thanks for the introduction, Jamie. Um, I just like to say I'm drinking. A, I switched my drink to my Pelican mug to be more Great Salt Lake themed. And random story, I went to Snow Basin once on a solo ski day trip, sat next to a random person on a lift, and it was the guy who made this mug. So I know him if you want to be hooked up with the Pelican mug. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the first time, so I'm from Illinois, and when I moved here for this job and saw pelicans flying above me, I was seriously amazed that these gigantic birds that I associated either with the ocean or with giant lakes like Lake Michigan or the Great Lakes was here in the desert. Um, you can see them flying high in the air, especially during the summer here in Utah. They've been documented to fly up to 30,000 feet in the air. They are really big birds, so you can see them when they're flying high. A lot of the times when they're flying super high, they're actually catching thermals and using that warm air to get high so that they can get to other feeding grounds over mountains. Um, you'll often see them together too because they're gregarious. And like I said, they are very big. They can range anywhere from 11 to 20 pounds. When pelicans are flying, um, especially during migration, they will be tethered to fresh water like lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. And that's because they eat things like fish and crustaceans. This image is data taken from pelicans that were captured around Great Salt Lake, either Gunnison Island or its wetlands. And you can see they go all over the place. So there used to be theories that the pelicans at Great Salt Lake were only coming from west of the Colorado or the Rocky Mountain Range, and you can see this orange line is a pelican that flew way east. So what I really want you to take away from this image is how Great Salt Lake is a hub, and these pelicans are coming and going from Great Salt Lake all over the, the United States and North America. Um, they come to Great Salt Lake because they rely on it not only for foraging and eating our fish in our wetlands, but also for breeding. So this is a map of Great Salt Lake. The two main reasons why pelicans come here are pointed to and circled. So you see over here, Great Salt Lake wetlands provide a lot of food for pelicans. And then they also use Gunnison Island in the north arm in that pink water for breeding. So this is a photo taken by a friend of mine called um, Laura Bingham. She takes awesome pictures of birds and goes birding all the time. And when she sent me this, I asked her if I could use it tonight. I, it's a picture of pelicans foraging in Farmington Bay. And what's really cool about how pelicans feed is they'll create a big circle around each other, kind of encircling the fish, and then move towards shallower water to capture them. So pelicans are often found not only around Great Salt Lake wetlands, but also at Strawberry Reservoir and other reservoirs in northern Utah. <clears throat> Surveys conducted by the Division of Wildlife during mid-September in 1997 estimated over 85,000 pelicans using Great Salt Lake wetlands for foraging and loafing. Not only do they come to the wetlands of Great Salt Lake, but they also come to Gunnison Island, where I point to you in that north pink water. Aerial accounts conducted by the Division of Wildlife has shown up to 20,000 breeding pelicans on the island. The average is more around 10, 11,000 but this is the highest count that we've had. Um, it's really surprising that you'll find this many pelicans and honestly seagulls out on the island because it's surrounded by this hypersaline water that ranges from 25 to 29% salinity. And there's literally rocks of salt when you pull up to the island. It doesn't seem like any life would be there, but as soon as you pull up to the island, you are immersed in thousands and thousands of seagulls. And when you get there, you will also see lots of pelicans. So it's a really cool, special place. And it's preserved as a WMA through the state. These are aerial photos of pelicans on Gunnison Island. They're, they arrive in May or March-ish May through May for breeding to find their breeding pairs. And these photos are actually from our annual aerial surveys, which happen from a plane. They've been conducting consistent, regular surveys of Gunnison Island since 1980 to get an idea of the pelican population. 
So this graph is um, some of the most recent data compiled that we have on pelican population. The blue line is Great Salt Lake elevation. You can see it goes up and down. It seems like it kind of mirrors the gray um, bars, which are the number of pelicans from those aerial counts I'm telling you about. And then this dotted line is the land bridge threshold where Gunnison Island is no longer an island which Jamie touched on a little bit about that and in the book about climate change too. So the most recent data that John Neal sent me today um, concluded that there's about 9,040 breeding population this year in 2020 on the island. So a little bit lower than the overall average, but the bar would look something like this. So a little bit higher than last year. Um, these aerial surveys are done in May to get an idea of the breeding population. And then also they come back in July when those juvenile pelicans are big enough to see, to see what the success was of those um, nesting pelicans. So that's been able to give biologists a good idea of nest productivity on the island. Originally they estimated way back in the day that it was like 70% um, success, but it's actually a quite a bit lower than that, just because of likely the harsh environment that they're living in. Another question biologists have had is, where are these pelicans going and coming to from Gunnison Island? Um, this has been taken care of, I guess, in two parts. One part's a MARC resite, and another part I'll tell you about is satellite data. The MARC resite study, um, involves biologists actually going out to the island. Most of the time we can get there by boat. Sometimes the water level is so low we have to take ATVs. They've been doing this, I believe, since 2011 or maybe 13. I might have to check that again. Um, but when they get to the island, they'll actually put these fences up and corral the pelicans by surrounding them and just kind of getting them to group up together trying to do it the least stress possible and as quickly as possible until they're corralled in this fence. The goal of the day is to get 500 pelicans. We want to give them wing tags and metal leg bands. So these potential wing tags are put on the part of their arm that I guess is the potagia and that's the area that actually won't harm them and they should be able to fly away. And then the metal leg band is also a backup as an individual like ID so that we can tell what pelican this was if we find it later. From 2011 to 2019, 3,714 juvenile pelicans have been tagged and banded. Once they're tagged and banded, they're set free from the corral to go off onto the island and hopefully be recited later. Since then, there's been about 432 unique resightings, or about 12% of total tagged pelicans. Now, there have been about 750 actual resightings, but some of those are the same pelican multiple times. So these 432 are the ones that are unique individual pelicans. Fortunately, 187 of those were actually resighted alive, which is really cool. Um, people have sent in really awesome pictures. This one from KS Nature Photography, I thought was awesome. It shows both wing tags and the leg band. Unfortunately, about 238 of the pelicans have been found dead since the tagging began. Whether it's left on the island like they never made it off the island, a tag maybe fell off of a pelican, it just didn't stand. Maybe they got stuck in the tar seeps, which I'm sure Jamie could tell you more about. Or um, a lot of the time they're found around promontory point or spiral jetty. It's often a juvenile pelican trying to make it to a feeding ground like Bear River Bay and they just didn't have enough energy that year to make it. The cool part of this study is it's given biologists a lot of data on where pelicans are going to after they leave Gunnison Island. You can see the pelicans found alive are the gold stars and the dead are the pink stars, which obviously there's a lot of the dead ones found around Great Salt Lake from the pelicans that just couldn't make it on their first journey to get food. So if you wanna get out there and look for a pelican with a wing tag, that would be awesome. You can report it to reportban.gov. 
the date and general area where you cited it's the most important and a picture is a super extra bonus. Uh, I, I'm not sure I didn't want to say you could email John Neal so he can correct me if I'm wrong, but you could probably also email John Neal. This way is also super efficient. I've done it once before when I spotted one and you even get a little certificate. So going back to this data of where pelicans are going to and coming from, uh, the reason why we have a lot of this data is because the airport has funded the D Division of Wildlife to figure out if the pelicans on Gunnison Island are causing an issue for the airport. As you know, Salt Lake City International Airport is really close to Great Salt Lake and pelicans can be a serious concern for airport hazard control. Like I said in the beginning, they can fly up to almost 30,000 feet. They're really big birds and they weigh a lot, so they can cause some damage. In fact, Utah has reported seven airplane collisions as of 2019 at their airport, three of which have caused substantial damage. So it's a serious issue and because of that, there is a big partnership between the airport, the Endangered Species Mitigation Fund, the U.S. Army Dugway Proving Ground, Tracy Avery and the division to put some satellite transmitters on pelicans. So it basically involves capturing an adult pelican and then fitting it with this backpack you can see over here in the right. It's small enough to allow them to fly and leave the area and then we can get some really great data on it. In 2012 and then also between 2015 and 2018, 68 pelicans were fitted with GPS backpacks. You can check out um, this map here Where is it? and other maps like it. So each line is an individual pelican like named Abigail or Bartholomew. And if you go to this website or simply Google PeliTrack, you can actually check that data out yourself and even pick a pelican um, to follow. So the data, if you zoom in closer to Great Salt Lake, is really interesting. Actually, so far it seems like the pelicans from Gunnison Island aren't necessarily the ones loafing and foraging by the airport, but instead are going on trips to places like Bear River Bay and Strawberry Reservoir. Um, like I said, they go to these places to feed and then bring back food to their young on Gunnison Island. Surveys conducted by the division show over 85,000 pelicans using it for foraging. So it's important to remember that not only are there 20,000 breeding pelicans on the island, but there's also a lot of um, non-breeding pelicans that really rely on water in Great Salt Lake and its wetlands for food. Um, I also wanted to point out with what little time I have left that the division does do more than just the breeding surveys. Um, the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program and the other wetland managers will do surveys often by airboat and try and get a count of how many non-breeding and just pelicans are using and utilizing the Great Salt Lake wetlands. As Bonnie touched on in the beginning, um, and the theme of the book is Great Salt Lake, a time and change, and the way that this could affect pelicans in particular is by not only increasing salinity in their wetlands where they rely on fish to eat, but also creating a land bridge to their island, which has happened in the past years. And like Jamie was talking about, those pelican in images have shown predators like coyotes able to reach the island. So we are concerned about water getting to Great Salt Lake for these pelicans. 20% of their breeding population is on this island. Um, they kind of have all their eggs in one basket here in Utah. And if we continue to see a land bridge and more drought and causing problems with their food in the wetlands, um, we would be really concerned about at least the pelicans here in Utah. With that, I just want to say thank you and thank you for listening. I put John Neal's contact information up here. He's the avian biologist and expert on all of this. And then my email if you have any further questions. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Ashley. I apologize, I forgot to read your bio because I was all excited about pelicans. 
<laughs> oh, it's boring anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so cool. Actually, I do have a fun fact about Ashley also that I learned. Um, she was the mascot for her high school, which is like pretty unique. And I found that out because um, we were working together on a talk and it turns out that I was the mascot for my high school. I was the um, Spartan woman at Murray High School. What were you, Ashley? What was, I can't remember. I was a, a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> I had to wear pleather. It was awful. Yeah. <laughs> so Ashley Kajowski is a wildlife biologist at the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program within the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. In her position, she is a part of a team that manages the commercial brine shrimp fishery to ensure parity among harvesters and control the harvest to ensure ecosystem needs are met. She is a past board member of Friends of Great Salt Lake and recently authored um, this chapter in the book, Great Salt Lake Biology. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from Illinois State University in Biology and Environmental Science and a master's degree from the University of South Dakota in Ecology with a focus on invertebrate community ecology and conservation. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that I read that because I omitted that. <laughs> 